Hello everyone, my name is Preston Dennett and today I'd like to do part two of my presentation on schoolyard UFO encounters. Uh, I did part one which was about sightings. I call part two schoolyard UFO encounters landings and humanoids. Uh, these I think are the much more exciting cases. About 30 to 40 percent of the hundred cases I documented involved landings or humanoids. Uh, often next to the school, sometimes on the school playground itself, and a few cases of these ETs actually entering into schools. Uh, there are a few abduction cases. Uh, these cases stretch back over a hundred years. So I'm going to just go through them chronologically and uh, tell you what, what happens when uh, a UFO actually lands next to a school. Uh, so the earliest case I could find occurred on July 24th, 1909, this is probably part of the cluster of sightings, the wave of sightings which occurred at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century involving weird Zeppelin-like objects because that's what these kids described at Kelso School in New Zealand. A group of students and a teacher saw this object approach from the horizon. It came very quickly, uh, darted around, it hovered, uh, the teacher said she was actually too frightened to observe it clearly. Uh, it came quite low. Uh, a bunch of kids did see it. Afterwards, the adults separated them and had them each draw pictures of what they had seen, and they all drew the same exact uh, shaped object, or very close. Uh, what's interesting is uh, several of the kids reported seeing a humanoid in some sort of a cockpit. A, a small man. Uh, this was not an isolated sighting, actually. There were sightings prior to this and after it, so it appeared to be part of a wave of sightings, but definitely came very low over the school and scared the wits out of these kids, and uh, particularly the teacher. So that's the earliest case. The next one I could find was about 15 years later in 1924. I couldn't find a lot of information on this case other than the main witness, her name is Evelyn Went, and she was just a little kid at St. Joseph Elementary School in Dade County, Florida, uh, when a UFO landed on the playground. She said it was pretty small, it was metallic, it had a sort of a pitted surface to it, and uh, small robotic beings came out. They spoke briefly, telepathically with her, gave her some information about the school, uh, said they would return again and uh, went back into their craft, which started to glow very brightly and then took off and was gone. Uh, that was apparently the last encounter she had. Uh, really, the cases began begin in 1950s. Uh, the earliest 1950 humanoid case I could find was October 15th, 1954. This occurred in a little town called Altus in Oklahoma. And uh, the main witness is a little kid who was on his way to school, riding his bike. He had just arrived at the school and was in front of the school when he saw everyone was looking up. A police officer, traffic had stopped, everyone was looking up at this metallic saucer-shaped object. It was about 500, 400 feet in the air quite large, gray metal, and uh, as he watched, these portholes opened up, and looking down out of this object were two humanoids, human-looking beings. Uh, the portholes closed, and this object darted away very quickly, uh, a couple of miles away, then darted right back, hovered again for just a few moments before being chased away by military jets. And uh, the next day, the newspaper said it was nothing but reflections in the clouds. Turns out there is something special about the town of Altus, Oklahoma. This is the location of an Air Force base which houses nuclear material. And in fact, 10 years later, there was a very famous incident of an object hovering right over the base where this nuclear material is being held. So I think that may have been part of the reason for this encounter. One year later, July 17th, 1955. This is another actually pretty famous encounter. One of the main witnesses is Margaret Fry, 
A few others have been located, but Margaret was in her vehicle with her doctor and another friend, and they were driving through Bexley, England, when this object started pacing their car. It got lower and lower. It was very large, and suddenly it goes right over the car and lands in the street in front of them. Uh, this is on the intersection of Ashburn and Whitfield in Bexley, England. And uh, this object lands. She gets out of the car, and a this object is just sitting there. A bunch of kids saw it. They surrounded the object. Adults saw it as well. Soon there was 15 or so people surrounding this object, which just stayed there. It was hovering just maybe a foot above the ground, rotating, and remained for about five, ten minutes when suddenly it lifted up slowly and then moved over a few blocks and hovered over the local Bedinwell Elementary School for a minute or two and then darted upwards and was not seen again. Uh, Margaret Fry ended up writing a book about this experience and other encounters that she investigated. Uh, one year, or actually one month later, August 25th, 1955, there was an encounter at Evansville High School in Indiana. Several students were at the school, this was at night, when they saw glowing, short, green humanoids playing on the football field. Uh, this is a serious report. It really frightened them. They called the police. Uh, what I find interesting about this particular case is that this took place four days and about 80, 90 miles away from, four days before and 80 miles away from another very famous case, uh, which we now know as the Hopkinsville, Kentucky case, in which the entire Sutton family saw this short green humanoid and actually shot at it. And it turns out there was a whole cluster of cases of sh green humanoids, glowing green humanoids, in this area at that time. And so yeah, they apparently visited Evansville High School in Indiana. Uh, one person who contacted me when he found out I was doing research into schoolyard yard encounters was Bruce Cornet. And he told me a very interesting encounter that happened to him in high school. At, this is at Conard High School in West Hartford, Connecticut. It was 1962. He was a band member and uh, often practiced there on the field. And uh, you can see him here in this photo. He's on the left. Uh, this was taken actually in 1962 at the time of his encounter. Uh, the encounter occurred at school. He was practicing for band with other students and was actually in the dressing room getting ready to change uh, into his uniform when suddenly his friend who was standing next to him socks him in the face, hits him right across the face. Bruce collapses to the ground and jumps up and accuses his friend of you know hitting him in the face and asks him why he did that. His friend looks at him like he's crazy and denies hitting him in the face. At that moment, someone else in the room screams out, Oh my God, how did it get to be so late? It's already a half an hour has passed. And uh, she had to get out of there. So that was all Bruce really recalled for a while. He started having other encounters. And uh, later on, some years later, we had a completely different memory of what happened uh, on that day. It, his friend did not hit him. What he remembered instead, spontaneously, was that a gray came rushing into the room and came around him and struck him with this sort of weird wand-like instrument on his head. Bruce remembers then, you know, blacking out, and he woke up. He was lying on the ground. He was surrounded by grays uh, who were moving around and kind of placing him there. It appeared that none of the other students around him were moving. It was like time had stopped. And suddenly the grays are gone. Time rooms back up and starts moving again at a normal pace. And he stands up and accuses his friend of hitting him. Uh, the whole memory of the experience left him for years. So yeah, I think there are probably cases of people being abducted um, out of schools. In fact, th that's not the only case like that. I know of another case where 
uh, witness saw grays moving through a classroom. Uh, time stopped, the grays came in, they walked up and down the aisles in the classroom. Next thing he knows, the grays walk out and class starts up normally and no one acted like anything strange had happened. Uh, another weird case occurred in 1964. When I did Contact in the Desert in 2019, I was approached by this witness and I interviewed her. She wrote this very detailed uh, story about what happened to her. And uh, it's a very interesting case. It was 1964. She was 12 years old at a Catholic high school in Mentor, Ohio. Her friend, she was on the playground when her friends suddenly said, look, look, what's that? And she turned in time to see this classic metallic gray saucer descending down from the sky. It got lower and lower and lower until it appeared to actually land uh, next to the school uh, in a grove of trees. This is something, again, we see quite a bit, these objects landing next to the school in a grove of trees, sort of disappeared from view. She couldn't tell if it had landed or not, but it was definitely below treetop level. Uh, and at this point, she said a, a weird thing happened. Time seemed to stop, or she, it was just her and the UFO. There was a sense of timelessness. This is another thing we see in these cases. And uh, she said she got a message, and the message was, remember this day. It was in clear English. It came twice. Uh, she doesn't think it was her own thoughts. It was uh, very uh, clear to her. At any rate, about that time, this object suddenly lifts up and darts away fast as a bullet. It, she saw a silver streak. She says, if you weren't looking at it, you probably would have missed it. And uh, after that, nobody talked about it, uh, which was very strange. She doesn't remember if, or know if anyone else in the playground besides her four friends saw it, uh, but it was an experience she remembers to this day, certainly, and uh, was not her only encounter. She would later have more encounters. A very interesting case occurred in December 1965. This is at Deer Creek Middle School in Shasta Lake, California. 45 students and a couple of teachers saw this metallic object. It was described as a 40-foot diameter silver disc, your classic flying saucer. It approached the school and came over the front of the school, went over the school, and seemed to land uh, behind the school in the, tr in the grove of trees there. Uh, so they called the police. The police came. Apparently there were some government agents who showed up as well. At any rate, one of the witnesses says that she went to that area after class had been let out. Uh, many other kids were going back and forth to visit this spot. And sure enough, there was a 40-foot ring diameter of crushed or burned grass, which actually remained there f for a number of years. She showed it to her mother. No plants would grow there. Uh, so yeah, it's another great case of a UFO landing next to a school. Uh, another case occurred in March 1966. 1966 was a huge year for all of these kinds of cases. This one comes from John Keel, a prominent investigator who was embroiled in an investigation in West Virginia, at Point Pleasant, West Virginia in particular, involving a lot of UFOs and, of course, what we now know as the Mothman. And one case he investigated took place at Point Pleasant School, a lady had shown up to pick up her kids and was shocked to see a flying saucer hovering above the playground. And not only that, there was a door open and a humanoid was floating outside the saucer. It was close enough where she could see it had weird eyes and a strange uniform on it. And she said this thing didn't even notice her. Instead, it was looking down at the kids. Uh, and I quote, very intently. So yeah, it seemed very interested in the kids on the playground. Uh, which is a little concerning, to say the least. Uh, one case in which I was able to invest, uh, interview one of the witnesses personally occurred also in March 1966 at Point Elementary School. Uh, this is in Missouri. The main witness is Melody Korn. She and her five friends were at Point Pleasant, or I mean, I'm sorry, Point Elementary School, uh, 
it was recess and most of the kids were playing four square and they decided they wanted to, to do something different. So they went out to the far side of the field, of the football field there. It's a very rural area and they were going to play tag. No sooner had they got there when Melody looks down and she sees all these weird footprints, little tiny footprints uh, that were, you know, half human sized maybe. They were bipedal, they could see that much and uh, they were trying to figure out who could have made these weird footprints when someone noticed a very bright light in the trees next to the school. Their first thought was ice cream truck. You know, they're young little kids. <laughs> it was a white light. Uh, so they decided to go past the school boundary, which they're not supposed to do, and go and investigate. And they went thinking it's an ice cream truck, but instead it came upon a disc. It was landed. It was fairly large, like a small room, maybe, silver. It had a light on top. Uh, they don't remember if there was landing legs or not because their attention was actually drawn towards a humanoid, a being that was much closer, about 100 feet away, maybe 50. And it was very short, had dark skin. It was wearing a uniform of some kind, very large eyes, a large bald head. It wasn't a gray, though. Its skin was very dark and kind of lumpy. It had a face almost like a gorilla, she said. And it was very strong. It looked muscular, like a gymnast. And it was staring Melody and her friends uh, in the eye. All the kids lined up in a row and kind of stared right back. This thing never broke its line of sight. It started to back upwards towards its craft. As it did so, it, there was a farm uh, where this object had landed and there was four cows. It reached out and touched one of the cows. That cow dropped down on its side, apparently unconscious. At that moment, Miss Ollendorf, one of the teachers at the school, approached from behind them and began screaming. Uh, she was utterly hysterical. She grabbed the kids and pulled them back into the school and ushered everyone on the playground back into the school. At this point, all the kids could now see this object in the trees, glowing and flashing lights. Uh, they ran into the school and ran into their schoolroom, classroom, and up to the windows. Miss Ollendorf rushes in and she's trying to close the blinds as all the kids are rushing up to the windows to peer at this object. She closes all the blinds and then goes and gets another teacher and the principal and uh, they immediately cut the school day short, send everyone off into the gymnasium. Uh, one of the kids is looking out one of the gymnasium windows, which is very high up, and he sees this object dart by. He screams and tells everyone, there it goes. At that point, the school buses show up, and everyone is sent home from school early. Uh, following this incident, it was the buzz of the school, but the teachers absolutely refused to discuss anything about it. Uh, but uh, to this day, the w there's at least four of those witnesses are still alive. The first case to really generate any real interest publicity-wise and certainly governmental-wise was one that occurred on March 21st, 1966. This was a case that actually uh, shook high levels of government at, at some point. Uh, this occurred at Hillsdale College uh, s among the witnesses were Barbara Cohn and Cynthia Poffenberger, who looked out their dorm window one night and saw this huge, glowing, saucer-shaped craft. They said it was beautiful, uh, had lights on it. It came very close to the dorm window. A huge crowd of students gathered. Soon there was uh, 60, 70, 80 students, almost 90. Uh, teachers saw this, school administrators saw this. This object hovered around, went over around the airport tower, came very close to the school. It actually landed at one point in this marshy area in front of the school. A bunch of the boys students were going to go out and chase it, but it lifted up again. The police were, of course, called. They viewed this object. One of the police officers uh, took out his gun and was going to shoot at it, but the other officer prevented him. Uh, this object remained for at least two hours before finally moving away. It was not an isolated sighting. There had been a sighting earlier 
uh, that day, uh, which was very well described, very credible. And that, over a period of months, there were a number of sightings. In fact, uh, some photographs were taken. Uh, here's one of the photographs right here. This is obviously not taken at Hillsdale College, which occurred at night, but this could very well be the same object. At any rate, this sighting did cause a lot of uh, waves of publicity, and the Air Force was asked to investigate, to look into it. Now they sent J. Allen Hynek from Project Blue Book, who showed up and really had just began an investigation, uh, was four days into it when he held a press conference, and it was just a media circus, he said. He felt like the press was looking for little green men, and he was looking for a logical explanation and raised the possibility that this was marsh gas. This was just one explanation he offered, but the press seized on it and said the Air Force thinks it's marsh gas. Uh, that wasn't exactly what Hynek said. At any rate, uh, he called this the low point of his career with Project Blue Book. He left shortly later. Uh, following this incident, Representative Gerald Ford called for an congressional investigation, uh, which there was one. Uh, the scientists involved in that investigation, that hearing, uh, said that UFOs were probably real and deserved further investigation. Nevertheless, at this point, the Air Force was just trying to extricate itself from having to deal with the public, uh, and they formed the Condon Committee shortly later, uh, which ended up getting a negative impression about UFOs. Uh, told officials that they should not teach this subject in schools, which I found interesting. And uh, ultimately, this led to the closure of Project Blue Book. Uh, Hynek, however, since then became a huge believer in UFOs. And it was this case which Jim and Coral Lorenz incited. Uh, and they said that they had uncovered a number of cases of UFOs hovering over schools around this time. Uh, so they were warning that UFOs are very interested in schools. Uh, Raymond Fowler had also noticed this same pattern and said that out of some 15, 20 cases, I believe it was seven, he said, were over schools. Uh, so yeah, they were probably uh, a little bit prescient there because it was literally two weeks later that the granddaddy of all schools yard UFO encounters occurred one of the biggest ones of all, certainly. It is Australia's most widely viewed and most famous sighting. It occurred on April 6, 1966, at Westall High School in Melbourne, Australia. Some 200, probably more accurately, 300 students and teachers saw multiple objects. It all began when students who were on the playground playing sports saw one, two, or three objects show up. Uh, one among these was Terry Peck. Uh, she and everyone screamed that this is flying saucers, and they watched one of these objects actually land in the grove of trees next to the school. This is a grove of trees they called the Grange, where high school students sometimes hung out to you know, become intimate <laughs> or uh, you know, smoke a cigarette or something like that. And so this object actually lands in the trees. Uh, Terry Peck is with a group of students who actually run out there uh, and wa see this thing land. Uh, she said it was like a small sports car, gray. Heat was coming off of it. It crushed the grass underneath. It was down on the ground for only a few seconds. A couple of students were so shocked they actually fainted. Uh, the paramedics showed up, ambulances and police. Uh, the press were shortly behind them, but at this point the object had landed for just a second and it took off immediately. First, it turned on its side and then darted away. Uh, the other objects uh, circled around for just a short time. Five planes showed up, Cessna planes, and were circling these objects. And... Uh, a bunch of students were in the school when all this was going on. A bunch of them were in Mr. Greenwood's class when someone came running in and said, there's UFOs <laughs> hovering outside. Uh, 
Marilyn Smith, she was a student in the class. She saw these objects. She didn't run to see the object landed. She just sat on the fence crying with her friend, thinking it was the end of the world. <laughs> Kevin Hurley saw these objects. Suzanne Savage, she was another witness who didn't go out there, but just sort of hung back. Uh, Jacqueline Argent saw it. Uh, Kathy Salas says it was definitely not a plane. Uh, Lance Brown, he was in Mr. Greenwood's class. He also saw it. Max Inverloch saw this object and also saw the landing traces it made. So this caused a complete panic in the school. Uh, the entire incident lasted some 20 minutes, perhaps. It's unclear exactly how long it lasted. Uh, but by the time it was gone, the police were there. The press had shown up and kids were tr trickling back into the school. Uh, the press was giving interviews and the military shows up. There were soldiers in uniform. They immediately chased away the media. All the kids were brought into the school. Some of the kids who had seen this object land were taken into uh, separate offices and not only questioned by the military, but basically threatened and told not to talk. Uh, there was a teacher there who was taking pictures during this whole incident. The military allegedly took her film. Uh, Graham Simons, Simmons, he was a teacher there. Uh, he was told specifically to tell children not to talk about this uh, incident. Uh, the military basically uh, shut the school down for that day. All the kids were brought into the auditorium for an emergency meeting by the headmaster, Frank Sambleby, who said that if you think you saw a UFO, you're mistaken. There's no such thing as UFOs. It was an experimental craft of some sort and you are not to talk about it. And uh, basically, that uh, was a cover-up that led to nobody talking about the incident. Those who did were given detention. Uh, there were a couple of newspaper articles uh, that, but were generally skeptical and the entire incident was pretty much forgotten for years. Uh, one year after the incident, researcher James McDonald did show up and interview uh, Mr. Greenwood and some of the other teachers and students. Uh, so there was research into this incident. There was an airport very nearby. Uh, they called the airport and asked about these five planes. The airport denied any knowledge of the incident or of the five planes, uh, which seems very pe peculiar. Uh, so yeah, this kind of, this event faded into history for quite some time until researcher Shane Ryan sort of revived it, made a documentary. He's since interviewed some hundreds of witnesses who've not only seen this object, uh, but saw the landing traces, which apparently were plowed over, <laughs> by the way, shortly after they were made. And uh, he's continuing his research. He's talked to people who were involved, involved in the official response. And uh, to this day, witnesses are still talking about it. Uh, there's actually a memorial on the site where this landing occurred. So yeah, Australia's most famous sighting by far. Uh, but this kind of la landing, I'm telling you, it's not unique. Another case occurred a few months later. Uh, this wasn't widely viewed. This was actually viewed by one person. October 1966, this case comes from John Keel again. He interviewed a man by the name of Larry Elmore. Larry Elmore had insomnia and would often take walks late at night, and he was taking a walk near his home. This is in Duncan Falls, Ohio. And he's walking by the Duncan Falls Elementary School when he notices this weird little shed that hadn't been there the, you know, before. And it was very strange looking. It had no windows. It was just gray metal. It was strangely shaped and didn't look like a shed at all. And, he's, and it gave him a very creepy feeling. And he walked by it and uh, thought that this was very strange and uh, went home and actually decided he was going to go take a second look and went to go see it and it was no longer there. So that shook him up very badly because it was clearly not a shed. And this was the case that really raised 
John Keel's suspicions, and he noted this case as being one of many that were next to schoolyards. Now, there's a weird timing aspect to a lot of these cases, uh, and uh, precisely one year after the Westall High School UFO incident, to the day, there was a really remarkable case in the United States, in Opalaka, Florida, to be precise, at Crestview Elementary School. It was April 6, 1967, and a group of six students and the teacher, Robert Apfel, were on the playground. Uh, all the other students had gone inside when one of the students pointed in the sky and said, Mr. Apfel, what's that? It was a metallic disc, uh, Mr. Apfel later said. Uh, he said it looked like two metallic lenses kind of placed rim to rim. It was just visible for a few moments and it went back inside. Or, I mean, it, w it disappeared and they went back inside. The next day was the real show. Uh, suddenly these objects showed up over the school. There was three of them and one landed in the trees behind the school repeatedly. Uh, all the students saw this. They ran out of the playground, some 200 students. There was complete panic. And uh, a number of teachers saw this as well. These kids were aged 9 to 13. Uh, Jimmy Hummel was one of the witnesses. He said this object was hiding and darting and hovering. Some of the kids were crying and screaming. Uh, Joe Cornblit saw it. Linda and John McCleary, br brother and sister, they saw it. Jill Myers, uh, David Bonfoy, he got a good look at it. Uh, some of the teachers who saw this, other than Robert Apfel, were Virginia Martin and Marion Waters. Uh, they drew pictures of this, as did some of the students. Uh, and as these objects were hovering there, the military shows up and actually pulls everyone into the school and tells them not to talk about it says that they're helicopters, that's all, and uh, shuts the school down. Kids are sent home. Those who can walk to school or who ride their bike to school were allowed to leave. And they said the objects were still there uh, when they left. They tried to approach, but they were stopped by a military barricade. And one kid said these guys had shotguns. Uh, the other students left by school bus, and they said the objects were gone by that point. Some students tried to approach the next day to get to the landing traces, and uh, it was still roped off. Some later did see the landing traces, though those two were allegedly destroyed at some point. Uh, the next day was Saturday, and the UFOs showed up again. Uh, there was a man, John Wolf, who lived next to the school, uh, he and his sons watched this object. They alerted the neighbors who alerted their neighbors, and soon there was a group of about 40 people watching these objects again hovering in the same grove of trees right next to the school. So that created another uh, press furor. Uh, but again, like the Westall case, this case seemed to slide into history and was forgotten. APRO, the Aerial Phenomena Research Organization, uh, did do some research into this case. But after that, there was little or no attention paid to it, as most of these cases uh, seem to be. They just kind of slide through history. Uh, some very weird cases. A very strange case occurred in May 1967 to a young student who prefers to remain anonymous. This was at Peebles Elementary School in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, this, this student was with her friend, on the playground when the janitor, Mr. Swan, motioned them over to come closer and he wanted to show them something. And he took them into the furnace room and said that this craft had l landed on the baseball field and that he was able, to, it was small and light enough that he was able to carry, drag it, apparently, <laughs> into this furnace room. Uh, it was very small, just like a very small, Volkswagen Beetle, uh, the witness said, and reminded her of a Jetsons car. You know, the Jetsons, the animated uh, TV series. Uh, she was looking at this thing. It had a clear, transparent dome on top. There was a control panel, weird colored lights. 
and she had the impression that this craft w was powered by a sort of propulsion device. Uh, her friend fainted at this point, which she thought was really funny, uh, but mostly her attention was drawn towards this being, this very short, four foot tall, gray, what she now recognizes as a gray. She wasn't scared. She said he looked very friendly, very childlike, uh, had four fingers, and he actually had a message for her. His, the message to the witness was, we are here to remind you who you are. She has no idea what this means, uh, doesn't know what it means to this day, uh, doesn't quite remember what happened after this, just remembers uh, walking home that day. She did tell her mother. Her mother believed her but was concerned. Uh, and to this day, she doesn't know what to make of this incident. It's a very strange case. So there are a lot of cases. I mean, we're in the 1960s right now. Uh, October 18th, 1967, Patrick Henry Junior High School in Sunnyvale, California. All the students were out on the playground. All the male students had just gone inside the locker room. The female students were just going back in when one, somebody shouted out, look, and there were these six sort of egg-shaped objects floating in the sky. Uh, about 40 students, 50 students actually saw this thing, uh, as well as a couple of teachers. The teachers became very concerned and ushered the girls inside very quickly. One of the witnesses stayed out as long as she could and saw these objects moving away and one of them appeared to land in the orchard behind the school. So after school, she made a point to go investigate and went out into this orchard and that's all she remembers. She believes she had missing time. Uh, she's pretty concerned about it. She remembers getting home late and uh, that's all she knows. She doesn't know what to make of it, but she does wonder about the fact that there was a military base near her home, Moffett Field, it's called in Sunnyvale. Uh, and she thinks that that might be related, but she doesn't know. Uh, yeah, there are cases where these ETs actually approach school students right at the school. Uh, another early case, 1967, Westmoreland High School in New York. Shane Kurz was with her mother sometime earlier and had seen a UFO outside their home in upstate New York. This case, by the way, was investigated by Hans Holzer, uh, who was a paranormal investigator, but did investigate UFOs as well. Uh, Shane Kurz said this object that they saw uh, scared them pretty badly, uh, so they decided to go inside. And it was some time later, not long, where she's walking to school one morning and is just about to go inside the school. She's right near the doors when she's approached by a gentleman, a very strange looking guy. He's got, you know, he's got very pale skin, uh, weird hypnotic gray eyes, uh, his ears are pointed, he's wearing strange clothes, he's, and he starts asking her questions in a weird foreign accent uh, in English. And uh, she's like, I have to go to school and you know, play volleyball. And he's like, well, what's volleyball? Uh, she's like, you know, basketball, volleyball. And he's like, what's basketball? So he was asking weird questions and then tried to persuade her to, uh, to go into his, quote, white vehicle that was in the field next to the school. Uh, there were no roads there. He pointed to this field and <laughs> she thought he was a very creepy guy and said no and turned around to walk into the school and realized how strange he really was and whirled around and he was gone. This was impossible. There should have been no place he could have run to. Uh, she was immediately approached by some friends who asked her, who is that weird man? Uh, so she knows she wasn't crazy. She wasn't the only one to see him. She says, I don't know, and didn't think much of it until a short few days later, uh, when she was at a convenience store near her home and there's this guy, she's looking through magazines and she sees the same figure, the same pale figure with the weird hypnotic gray eyes and pale skin uh, staring at her in a very creepy fashion. She, so she leaves the convenience store, uh, but it was just a few days later she was abducted out of her home into a UFO and on board the UFO 
she saw this same figure. So yeah, he was apparently stalking her this whole time. Uh, another case occurred just a few years later, January 15th, 1969. These cases occur all over the world. This case occurred in Via Franca de los Berros Jesuit College in Badajoz, Spain. Uh, this is a religious college and a UFO was seen, a glowing saucer-shaped object was seen landing uh, in the rural sort of fields outside the school uh, by students as well as a couple of teachers. And uh, that evening, some of the students, multiple students, said that they saw this very tall being peering in through the windows of the school building. Uh, it was described as being very tall and had a greenish hue to its skin and a very broad face. Uh, not human. Uh, the students were very concerned, but the priests who ran the school refused to discuss it, refused to let the students talk about it, and actually forbid them from talking about it. And it was only years later when one of the students told his parents that this case was uncovered. Uh, another case involving a landing occurred on April 30th, 1970. This is at Nathaniel Hawthorne College in Antrim, New Hampshire. A bunch of the girls, the ladies in the women's dorm, reported a UFO had landed outside the school. Uh, the police were called. Press got wind of the incident. There was an article written. Uh, but the girls did receive some teasing from some of the boys uh, at the dorm until a few days later at night, uh, some of the guys were outside the school uh, when a UFO rose up from behind the trees. It was very dark. They couldn't make out its shape at first, but it turned out to be a large triangular shaped object. And it rose up and went right over their heads, blotting out the, the stars. And need needless to say, uh, they now believed the girls when they said this thing had actually landed. Uh, another case was found, or I mean, occurred on August 21st, 1970. This is a very bizarre and interesting case, which occurred actually in Bukit, Malaysia, uh, at Stowell Elementary School. The teachers and students noticed that one of the students was missing. Uh, they conducted a search and found him outside of the school grounds in the forest there. He was unconscious. They dragged him back into the school. He woke up and he said that a UFO had landed next to him. It was very small, like the size of a football. Little tiny beings came out. He tried to approach and capture one of them and it shot him with a beam of light on the arm uh, and knocked him out. He pointed to his arm where there was a small burn. Uh, teachers did not know what to make of this incident. He drew the beings that he saw, the craft. Uh, but in the weeks and months following this, a bunch of these, these students reported the same thing. These tiny craft landing next to the school and little beings coming out. It was a wave of sightings which occurred over a period of months and then finally stopped occurring. Uh, another abduction case occurred in the late 1970s to Jean Marie Robinson. She wrote a book about her experiences called Alienated. Uh, it took her a while to realize she was having UFO experiences. She didn't realize this when she was a high school student at a high school in the Ozarks area of Missouri. Uh, one evening, she and the, all the girls at, high, at her local high school decided to have a slumber party. This was a yearly event they did. She was pretty excited about it. Fifty girls showed up and spent the night at the school gymnasium just talking and swapping ghost stories and things like this. And in fact, Jean and a group of about 20 other students decided that they were going to hold a little seance. And they went into one of the side rooms there with one of the teachers and conducted this little seance. To their shock, this misty ghost-like form entered into the room through the wall and approached them and it caused complete panic. Uh, Jean remembers becoming very disoriented, 
fainting, and this being, this apparition, disappeared. Uh, for years, she thought this was a ghost. You know, I need to say this cut the sands short. Uh, but uh, she thought this was a ghost for years, but was having a lot of UFO experiences following this, and eventually sought out Bud Hopkins and underwent hypnosis. And under hypnosis, a very different scenario emerged. Uh, she recalled that during the seance, instead of this misty form coming in, it was a gray, not only one gray, actually five of them. Five grays came through the wall, approached five of the girls, including Jean, and floated them out of the gymnasium through the wall and into a UFO that was landed next to the high school. Uh, inside the UFO, they underwent an examination and some sort of gynecological procedure. It was not pleasant. Uh, they were immediately returned back to the gymnasium. Each girl was put back in her proper position, and uh, the grays left. And then time suddenly started up again, and they thought it was a ghost. Everyone screamed and panicked and ran into the main room. It was, yeah, years later that she realized that this was probably an abduction. So that's how it goes in some of these cases. Uh, so there are weird aspects to these cases. Here's one that occurred in May 1972 to a boy by the name of Carl Wilson. He was just a kid at the time. He, his brother, and his father were in Fort Worth, Texas, making deliveries. His father did deliveries and often brought his sons along. And uh, Carl had joined him that day. It was a Saturday uh, when this UFO showed up. And he noticed it was hovering right over the high school. It was very strange because his brother and father didn't seem to pay much attention to it at all. Uh, n he did see some people staring at it. He did see cars stopping and looking at it. He tried to get other witnesses but wasn't able to. And uh, they moved on to their next delivery. He saw this object again. It was hovering over the junior high school. He later saw it hovering over the elementary school. He, s he said, and I quote here, the objects I saw were hovering over all the schools in town, which was weird because it was a Saturday and there was nobody in the schools. Uh, but yeah, he tried to get more witnesses. His brother wouldn't look. His father forbid him from looking. His father seemed very nervous about the whole thing. At one point, there was some confusion about time. Uh, there was at least four or five sightings they had of this object appearing and reappearing and so on. And uh, definitely strange levels to this case because it was years later that Carl started having major UFO experiences and realized he was an abductee. But it's weird that it hovered over all the schools. I think in some cases these objects are putting on displays and want to be seen. I mean, consider what happened at Rosemead High School. This is in Middleburg, South Africa. On November 12, 1970 school, 1972, the principal of the school was in his home. His school is right next, his uh, home is right next to the school. And uh, he noticed these weird lights hovering in the tennis courts uh, next to the school, red lights swirling around. And he vowed to go out there and take a look. And uh, it turns out he was not the only witness who saw this. There was police officers who were looking at this from a distance using binoculars. There were also some guards at an oil field who saw these red lights descend over the high school and apparently land and uh, at some point took off. The next morning, the principal went to the tennis courts and got a real shock. These tennis courts are surrounded by a tall fence. They're locked. They were still locked, but the tennis courts were destroyed. They were tore up. All the tar not all of it, but much of it was torn up. None of it was overturned. Just It was weird because pieces of this tar were just missing. They later found a bunch of it outside of the fence, on the fence, uh, some as far as a couple of hundred yards away. Uh, there were no tire tracks, no indication that the fence had been disturbed. They did notice that the blue gum tree next to the school, the leaves on it were burned and withered. Uh, 
A bunch of people examined the damage done to these tennis courts. No one was able to figure out what happened. Scientists look, looked at it. Uh, it wasn't an explosion of any kind that they could figure. It wasn't a whirlpool or a tornado. It wasn't lightning. They don't know what it was. Uh, I think this was a purposeful display where these UFO occupants tore up the <laughs> tennis courts to let people know again that you know something that they don't know about is out there. Very bizarre case occurred uh, two years later, March 20th, 1974, to Becky Ingram of Louisville High School in Tennessee, in Louisville, Tennessee. She was walking across the football field one day, this is midday, and suddenly found herself on board a UFO. Uh, she was surrounded by short humanoids who grabbed her, took her, and uh, examined her. She said it was not pleasant. It was a very brief experience. Next thing she knows, she's back on the football field. She now speculates that this object was actually landed there, but was invisible. Uh, she did suffer some after effects from this encounter, including, including excessive urination, excessive thirst, headaches. So she was disoriented for some time. Uh, she had nausea. Uh, these symptoms eventually faded, but she was later visited by men in black uh, who threatened her about the incident. Uh, oh, another very bizarre case comes from well-respected researcher Leonard Stringfield, uh, who had gotten a call from a, student, a young man, a student, who said that uh, he was afraid he was going to be kidnapped by a UFO. Stringfield wasn't home at the time, so he wasn't able to talk with the student, but he returned home later and got the message and uh, was going to call the student, but instead the student's father called. Uh, the father was frantic and said that his son was missing and could Leonard help. Uh, he knew that his son had called Leonard Stringfield because he had called the police as well, and uh, you know, found out that his son had called Leonard Stringfield. His son had actually told him, because it turns out the day before, this boy had come home from school for a uh, fundraiser and said that a UFO had followed him home and he was afraid it was going to kidnap him. His parents didn't believe him. And the next morning, they woke up and found a note on the kitchen table written by their son and it explained that he, he was still afraid this UFO was coming for him. He had withdrawn $500 from the bank and was fleeing because he was, did not want to be kidnapped by this UFO. Uh, long story short, they found the boy at Atlanta Airport. They took him home. He was still very frightened. They called up Leonard Stringfield and got the whole story from him. It turned out that one year earlier, the boy was on the playground at his high school when a UFO showed up. It was pretty low, metallic, and he felt it had singled him out, was looking at him. And that night, he was visited by weird humanoids in his bedroom uh, who told him telepathically, don't be afraid, but you need to come with us. So yeah, this poor boy, I was afraid he was going to be uh, encountered, you know, abducted by ETs. And I honestly don't blame him. Lots of cases all over the world. June 19, 1975, at Latoka Methodist School, Mission School in Fiji, uh, there was a very strange encounter where a bunch of school, elementary school students, said that they were approached by eight hairy dwarfs. They were about t two feet tall and uh, the students chased after them and these short little hairy dwarfs uh, immediately ran off into the brush that surrounds the school. Uh, so there's a legend on Fiji of little people. This could have been them or it could have been ETs. They did not see any actual UFO. Uh, but this is another case of you know, ET, you know, weird humanoids on the playground at the very least. Uh, another case, which was certainly disturbing, occurred over a period of years in the mid-1970s. 
Uh, this occurred at Falls Elementary School in Green Valley, California. Uh, the main witness said that she attended this school from kindergarten through sixth grade. And during this whole time, the whole time she was there, she'd be out on the playground and would be approached by a weird student who always looked a little strange, who looked like a normal student at first. Uh, but she started to see through this sort of screen memory and saw that it was actually a gray. You know, it was bald and weird eyes, and you, you know, the whole deal. Uh, but norm normally she would just think it was a student, a weird student, and he would ask her all these weird questions and try to get her to go into the grove behind the school. Sometimes he also taught her stuff, weird mathematics and things that kind of went over her head. She doesn't remember a lot of it. She's trying to piece back her memory. This all came back to her years later as an adult, after the school had been torn down. But she does have memories of other children being taken. Uh, she remembers at one point authorities had to be called because one of the children had been traumatized or hurt and uh, the school forbade anyone from going into the grove behind the school following this one particular incident. Uh, so it's not, you know, I know of another case which I wasn't able to investigate. It's not in the book where apparently an entire class was, an invest was abducted. So I don't know. Uh, I think there could be a lot more abductions in some of these landings that we're not aware of. Uh, there are cases where these objects actually follow school buses as well. Uh, one case occurred in December 1976 uh, outside of Whitehorse. This is in the Yukon area of Canada. And uh, the main witness is a school bus driver and her daughter. Uh, this school bus driver became concerned because this object started to appear and pace her school bus. Happened not once or twice, but multiple times over a period of over a month. Many of the students saw this object as well. Uh, it always kind of paced the bus from a distance, but still made her nervous enough that she told the school that she would like to change her route and get a different route. Uh, the school granted her the change, and uh, it didn't work. She was driving her new route, and uh, this object still showed up. Uh, one time she's driving home with her daughter. They're the only ones in the school bus when this object approaches again. This time it comes much closer, and act they stop, and this time it approaches right in front of their school bus, and they, there's a big porthole, and they can see humanoids. Uh, figures, silhouettes, looking at them through this uh, window. It scared them very badly, but that turned out to be the climax of the event, and following this, they stopped being followed by this UFO. But it's certainly not the only school bus incident, or even one that occurred at a school bus stop, <laughs> where the children got very freaked out. Uh, one very famous and well-known case uh, occurred in at Broadhaven, elementary school, primary school in Wales. This occurred on February 4th, 1977. I don't want to go into too much detail on this case because it's already been pretty well investigated by researchers like uh, Randall Jones Pugh or uh, Neil Spring, both of who have done research on this incident. But at any rate, it's an incredible case. More than a dozen students we're out in the playground in front of the school when an object showed up and quickly landed uh, right in the trees next to the school. It was described as about 40 feet long, bluish, maybe silverish. It had a red light on top, a door opened, and an ET emerged. It was described as short, wearing a silver blue su suit. Uh, many of the kids became very frightened. Uh, David Davies saw it. Uh, he said it was pearlescent. It had a dome on top. He was one of the last students to run up and see this thing. Uh, Michael Matheson saw it. He said it had a silver dome and a light on top, just like the other witnesses. David George saw it. He said it was humming. humming. He saw a humanoid in a silver suit. He said it had little ears, weird kind of ears to it. Philip James Rees saw it. Uh, as soon as it landed, he ran to get help from the teachers. Uh, the teachers refused to listen to him. 
uh, did not believe him. Uh, David Ward saw this object, saw the humanoid come out. Uh, he said it was short. It had weird ears. It was carrying perhaps a weird camera. Uh, maybe had a, you know, he described a uniform that was bluish or silver. Uh, Jeremy Passmore saw it. Tudor Jones, Colin Davis. He also described a blue uniform. Uh, all these children saw it. Uh, afterwards, the teachers didn't believe them at first until a sep they separated them, had them all draw pictures. Uh, it was clear the kids were sincere. Some were crying. Uh, they stuck to their story. They've always stuck to their story. Uh, they were still sticking to their story. Uh, they signed a petition following this event, turned it into police. Turned out at this time there was a huge wave of sightings. Investigators later found out. Uh, the Ministry of Defense denied any knowledge of, the, of this sighting. Investigators found out, however, that not only did they know about this sighting, they conducted their own investigation into it. So yeah, it's an incredible case. Uh, there's been reunions among these students to this day. It affected them very deeply. Another case occurred on May 6th, 1977. This is back in California, in Encinitas, California, to, at Ocean Knoll Elementary School. It's an amazing case. Uh, involves about 15 students and at least two teachers who were on, at school when they watched this object suddenly come down next to the school, very low, circling around the school, and it had a huge porthole, and they could see humanoid figures inside. They didn't get a good la look at it before this thing actually landed in this little canyon next to the school. And uh, they didn't see it take off. They couldn't get close to it because there was a fence and it, the canyon was somewhat steep. Uh, they went, went, were in class and came out about an hour later for, on the playground when this object rose up from the canyon and began to circle the school again at an altitude of about 100 feet. Again, it had a large, pi large picture window. There were about four humanoids inside. Uh, who the students described as perhaps wearing masks or looking strange, having lumpy faces. One student had binoculars and actually looked at these things through binoculars. Some students heard a low buzzing noise. Others said it was completely silent. And it circled the school for just a few minutes and then took off. Uh, one of the students went home that day and told her dad what happened? He was shocked. She's like, yeah, it had a window. It looked like two plates stuck together. Uh, it was totally silent. Uh, he went to the school and confronted the teachers. Teachers refused to verify it, refused to talk about it. Teachers that actually told the students not to talk about it. He started questioning the students. Some of the students denied it or admitted seeing something but said it wasn't anything. Uh, but he found some students who did give a very de good description and described the porthole uh, and as well as seeing the humanoids. Uh, so it's a pretty well verified case. Uh, he called the police who showed no interest. He called the news who showed no interest. He eventually found a UFO organization who agreed to take an interview. But it's a case that's gotten virtually no publicity whatsoever. Uh, so many cases. January 31st, 1978. This is at Montvale Memorial Elementary School in New Jersey, Montvale, New Jersey. Three kids, John, Michael, and Eddie, age 10 and eight years old, saw this UFO hovering low over the playground. They were alone. This was not a weekday, uh, but this was, was on the school playground. And uh, this object was hovering at about 500 feet when suddenly it dart, you know, sends down a beam of light and then darts away. And moments later, they see these weird figures walking down the, the street, lining the school. And th they're very strange because they're bald. They've got very strange eyes. And they're wearing yellow jumpsuits and uh, kind of walking in a strange manner. And uh, the kids become concerned when suddenly this UFO drops down out of the sky again, very low, and this time they see another humanoid. It's much closer. It appears to be female, and uh, they're trying to 
figure out who this humanoid is when a police car drives by, the female humanoid disappears or turns invisible, the police car leaves, and this humanoid reappears. That's enough for the kids. They run away, they run home. Uh, one of them lives right next to the school. They tell the older brother, and he looks out the window just in time to see this object leaving. They're hysterical. They call the police. The police come over, can see that the boys are absolutely sincere but don't know what to make of their story, and realize it's a UFO. So they contact UFO investigators, and eventually this case reached uh, UFO investigators Bud Hopkins, Ted Bletcher, and Patrick Hugh. Uh, who did a, a long interview with all of the boys and found them perfectly credible, uh, but didn't know quite what to make of uh, the case, particularly because it was right there next to the school. Uh, another case, a few years later, one year later, actually, January 13, 1979. It's one of the strangest cases. 12-year-old Marcus Rafael Suarez is at Loreto School in Santiago del Estero. This is in Argentina. His father is a janitor of the school, so he'd sometimes accompany him and uh, was alone in the janitor's office when suddenly a UFO showed up inside the room, which was closed, by the way. The door was closed. And uh, it was very small, just a few feet across, and two humanoids emerged from it. And one of them came over to uh, Marcos, grabbed him on the arm and pulled him onto a chair. Marcos found himself paralyzed. One of the beings left the room briefly, came back, and uh, they shined this weird red light into Marcos's eyes. And he passed out, woke up. He was very disoriented. His face was hot and flushed. The room uh, stunk badly. He ran and got his father, who s smelled the strange odor, saw his son's red face, and uh, called authorities. An investigation followed, and it turned out that there was some evidence supporting this. People in the area suffered weird electronic disturbances. One person's refrigerator malfunctioned. Another person's fan stopped blowing. It just cut out. And several people reported static, weird static on their radio. So lots of cases of UFOs landing next to the school. I've got just a few more cases that I'd like to share with you. Uh, one occurred on March 10th, 1979 at Views Creek in North Carolina. There was only one witness to this because it occurred in the wee hours of the morning. This witness lives right next to Campbell College. Uh, right on the border of the campus. Her bedroom overlooks it, and she woke up one day because her room was filled with light, and she looks out the window and is shocked to see a very large flying saucer landed on the campus. Uh, this was an area that was undergoing new construction. And she said this thing was easily twice the size of two tractors, just enormous. Uh, she doesn't say how the experience ended, uh, but uh, what's very peculiar is here's another object landing right next to the school. Uh, another case occurred in Belgium, in the city of Hainault, Belgium. Two kids were walking to school and had just about reached the school. They could see the school. And hovering right over the school was a very large object. Suddenly it swoops down and approaches them and lands next to them in a field. And a door opens and a being comes out and waves them over. They voluntarily walk on board and had a very pleasant encounter with humanoid ETs who they said gave them you know, a ride in the saucer and kind of took them on a tour through space, uh, on a tour of the solar system, which sounds outrageous, but I have to tell you there are many cases like this of kids who've you know, had sort of what amounts to a fun ride in a UFO. Uh, I've investigated one case personally. I know... Ray Fowler said he had this experience where he was taken as a kid and shown the planet Saturn. Uh, one kid I know saw had the same exact experience. They showed him Saturn. Uh, so yeah, these cases may sound strange, but they do happen. Uh, another case occurred just a few years later 
at the Tierra y Libertad Primary School where an object approached and hovered next to the school over the telephone wires. Some said it actually appeared to land on the transformer box there. A door opened up and three humanoids exited. They floated over the telephone wires, over a nearby house, across the street, over the fence, and landed in the playground, <laughs> right there on the playground it's itself. One of the witnesses, Teresa Mayola, said the figures were glowing. They were about four feet tall, hairy, uh, and uh, some teachers saw this UFO as well. I don't know if they saw the little beings, which the children started to chase around the playground. Uh, one of the kids actually chased this being into the school halls itself. I don't know how this case ended, but it, uh, it was referred to me by uh, Albert Rosales, uh, who brought this case to my attention. And uh, yeah, w one of many cases uh, which are occurring all over the world. Uh, one case I investigated personally occurred around 1982 to someone I've known for years and years. I'll call her Melinda. She doesn't want her real name used. Uh, she was a college student at the time. She was near her home and was walking with her dog late at night to go and retrieve a grocery cart that she had found lying abandoned next to the school near her home. And so she's walking by Stag Street, elementary school, which she had attended, by the way, as a little girl. Now she's in college. Uh, she's walking by the school, taking this cart along with her dog when she sees two children standing next to the school. She thinks they're children, but realizes, you know, it's after 11 o'clock at night. It's pretty late for children. And as she approaches them, she realizes they're bald. They look very strange. They're extremely short, and they're standing face to face right next to each other, almost kissing, but not kissing. So the behavior was very strange. And as she gets within 10 feet of them, they turn and look at her. She locks gazes with them. And she said it was like being woken up when you're already awake. They weren't human. They had large, dark eyes, very pale white skin, huge heads, were wearing green suits with mandarin collars and uh, freaked her out. They were just floating there, <laughs> opened like a book, she said, and just stared at her. Uh, she quickly looked away and walked as away as fast as she could without running. She didn't want to panic uh, and uh, didn't look back. Her dog took no, no notice. She had no awareness of any missing time. She didn't see any flying saucer or anything like that. Uh, has had no prior experiences or experiences after this but says that per there could have been a UFO easily landed in the playground, which was surrounded on three sides by buildings, horseshoe-shaped buildings, and on the other side by trees. So it could have easily remained hidden. Uh, just a few more cases I'd like to share with you. Another occurred actually at Roosevelt Elementary School. This is now called Great Springs Elementary School. Uh, this occurred in Great Falls, Montana, May 1st, 1997. A student saw this, a number of students saw this glowing object that looked like a rainbow, they said. Just little round glowing rainbow. Uh, really pretty. And one student was looking at it, became kind of disoriented, times he had a weird sense of timelessness, and suddenly the bell is ringing, which really confused him because he kept very close attention to time, and whenever anyone would line up after recess, he would be the first in line to get back in school. Uh, he was shocked to find that he had completely missed the bell and uh, ran up. All the kids looked at him strangely, uh, as if he had appeared out of nowhere. And it was a very disorienting experience for him. He wondered if something else had happened. And later that night, he had a dream that he was actually inside this object. He saw other kids from the elementary school there. And they were all being given tests. He said there were short humanoids. He doesn't remember what they looked like. But the humanoids wanted to test these children uh, in psychic abilities, apparently. One test involved telekinesis. The kids had their hands held behind their back by some force 
while glowing sticks like firebrands were thrown at them and the kids had to deflect them using telekinesis, mental powers. Another test was to take this box which was floating in front of them and change its shape or turn it into a different direction. It was a kind of a trick question because the only way they could uh, to complete the test successfully, they had to turn the box inside out, uh, which took some of them some time to figure out how to do. Uh, it's a weird case, but a, another apparent abduction. Uh, I know that there's another case which occurred at Paso Tempo School. This is uh, where in Minas Garris, where an employee of the school heard another student screaming. Uh, this is in Minas Garris, Brazil, and uh, saw a short humanoid out the window wearing a black suit running across the campus. Uh, another case, um, probably the most famous case of this kind, is the Ariel Elementary School. This is September 16, 1994, Rua, Zimbabwe, at the Ariel Elementary School. This is a pretty rural area. It's got a very large playground. Uh, yeah, and on September 16th, uh, that morning, there was about 200 kids on the playground. Only one teacher who was minding a snack bar. Usually there'd be more teachers, but they were having a school conference at the time. Uh, so all these students were mostly alone on the playground when three glowing objects appeared, silver or glowing. Uh, they looked like orbs at first, uh, appeared to be following the telephone wires, one kid said, uh, and they came closer and closer to the school and uh, finally one of these things landed. It looked like a classic flying saucer with little legs on it, portholes, some kids said, and uh, landed right next to the school. At least 60 kids saw this. Uh, it caused complete panic. Some of the students ran to get help. They went to the lady who was minding the snack bar. Uh, she did not believe them. Uh, meanwhile, the kids are crowding around at the edge of the playground here, looking at this object, when three humanoids exit. They were universally described as very short, with very weird eyes, and a dark uniform. Otherwise, there were minor variations. Some said that they did see hair on these, uh, on one of these entities. At any rate, a smaller group of students did see these entities, and one of them approached right up to the students and kind of stared at them. And one of these students was uh, Salma Siddiq, and uh, she was face to face with this one of these beings. Another was Emily Trim. Uh, Francis was another, Lizelle. A lot of these kids actually got messages. Emily Trim said that the being communicated telepathically with her and she got a flood of images and it was all about technology. And that we, there's a right way to use technology and a wrong way to use technology and we could do much better. Another kid, Francis, was warned about pollution. Another child, Lizel, was warned that we need to take care of the planet properly. Uh, so they were given these sort of warnings about the environment. And uh, the object didn't stay very long. There's some confusion about time uh, with some of the students. And uh, eventually the being returned back into the craft, which took off. All the students ran in a group to the teachers and they were hysterical. The teachers were unable to calm them down for some time. Uh, the parents showed up to pick up their kids and of course the parents became upset. Some of the kids walked home and said what happened and were not believed. Uh, others were because it was clear the children were traumatized. Uh, so this had a huge effect on the students. The first investigator to show up, show up was Cynthia Hind, uh, who talked to many of the students. Uh, she realized this was a huge case. She contacted John Mack, who went over there and interviewed the students not long after the incident. He also interviewed the headmaster, Colin Mackey, who verified that the students uh, s 
reported this thing. All the students drew pictures of what they had seen. Uh, so it's, yeah, an incredible case, uh, which sent shockwaves, I think, through the UFO community and the world, and was really the case that brought attention to schoolyard UFO sightings in a way that has never been brought before. And uh, this case is still being researched. The main researcher to this case is Randall Nickerson, who has put together a documentary called The Aerial Phenomenon, which is due to be released shortly. He's worked on it for many years. Uh, yeah, it's an incredible case, uh, but not unique. After I published the book on, uh, about these incidents, I was contacted by researcher Reynero Hernandez of the Free Organization, uh, who wanted me to know that he had talked to a teacher, an elementary school teacher, uh, who was at a primary school in Colombia, in South America. This is around the same time as the Rua Zimbabwe incident occurred, and it was virtually identical. A UFO landed next to the school, it was seen by students, beings came out, messages were given. Uh, so far there's been no formal interviews done. Uh, so this case is still pretty much up in the air, but it does appear to have many, if not all, of the same elements as the Rua Zimbabwe case. So just one more case I'd like to discuss occurred on April 30th, 1998. And uh, this occurred in Sri Lanka, actually, at a Adikiram Primary School in the Banda Rawela, Sri Lanka. Uh, this was on April 30th, 1998. Uh, some of the students arrived early to school to unlock the classrooms and get everything ready. These were the really good students, you know, the pupils who excelled and were in line for scholarships. When suddenly they heard this very large sound, very loud sound, uh, coming from the playground, they ran out and were shocked to see this object, which wasn't very large. It was like 20 feet across uh, and uh, had landed on the playground, literally right next to the school. It was there for only a few seconds when it took off like a bullet straight up and uh, hovered briefly and then disappeared. All the students started showing up and uh, the students who saw this craft land pointed out the landing traces uh, so they drew what they had seen as well. The teachers and the students were all very much impressed. An investigation followed by researchers who found out that it was not an isolated sighting. The kids had been seeing a UFO over the school repeatedly in the months before this. They called the object Coca or Stork because it kept flying over this, the school like a stork. And it uh, turns out several adults uh, around this time, had also seen the UFO in the area. So that's a basic overview of all the landing and humanoid cases. Uh, I did a full study of them again in my book, Schoolyard UFO Encounters. Uh, there's more than 100 cases. I suspect there's a lot more than that because most people do not report these encounters and some of them have been covered up. Uh, I'm speculating here, but I believe the purpose of these encounters is sort of an agenda of the UFOs announcing their presence. Uh, there does seem to be some cases involving direct contact messages and even abductions. So there is that, uh, but that seems to, to be much rarer. Usually these beings are just getting out and showing themselves or landing. I know of other cases. There's a case in England where ET people saw uh, an object come over the school. It stopped. There was a porthole. They saw humanoids. Another case involving humanoids apparently in a school in Illinois. Another in Arizona. So I know there are more cases that I have not looked into at all. Uh, so I'm pretty sure that this is going to happen again. Uh, my, I suspect the reason the ETs are doing this is sort of a grassroots movement uh, because we, we know that they have gone to the government, but the government has failed to disclose. 
the government has not been transparent or forthcoming or truthful about the subject. So I'm speculating that the ETs uh, who want themselves known and who are pushing disclosure are putting on these displays, these publicity st stunts in an attempt to announce their presence. It's a very clever ploy, I think, because uh, it really convinces kids but sort of has a, a minimal effect on society until later. And uh, it's been, I think, remarkably successful because today there is pretty much a universal belief in UFOs among the younger generations. So that's why I think that is their real main agenda. So that's it. Thank you very much again for listening. Uh, once again, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much and keep having fun.